I am again returning to what seems to be my own new reality. Lifelike dreams that are so vivid that I cannot make the distinction between what is real and what isn't. Although I find this phenomenon to be confusing, strangely it doesn't concern me at all. In fact, I feel totally fascinated by these strange events taking place in my dreams. With each new dream, I become increasingly curious as to what will come next. It seems that through my dreams, I am living another man's existence in another place and time. And each new dream is giving me a glimpse into that strange, yet familiar world. For instance, in my current dream, I am being faced by two men. One older man, unusually large. The other younger and seemingly in charge. Are these the men Kim Lee read to me about? Is my imagination taking over and finishing the story? Their faces and their demeanor seemed as familiar to me as Kim Lee's. And yet I felt as if I knew intimate details about them that were not recorded in the journal that Kim Lee had read to me. The men facing me seemed very saddened by our encounter. Behind me is a woman with a young boy hugging her waistline with his face buried into her midsection. The woman was holding her head down weeping quietly as the three of us carried on our conversation. There were words coming out of my mouth that I did not originate but fell perfectly into our conversation. It was as if I were an actor playing a part and reciting my lines on cue. The stage has been set and I will just have to see where it takes me. The younger man must be the armory captain from the man's journal. His face was very animated with emotion and his voice straining to utter the words. His majesty has sent us here to carry out his royal decree. You know from the first day you appeared before him that many of the ministers in his court have been plotting against you. They are still seeking to control the king through acts of deception and manipulation of the court by inciting the people with lies. These are the same traitors who were actually among the court that was involved with the Japanese invasion and they are colluding together to discredit you and have been pressing his majesty to have you put to death. Portraying you as a danger to the throne. They have purposely caused trouble for the subjects of the kingdom through currency manipulation, unfair taxing, and trade restrictions that are causing hunger and unrest. They are blaming you saying that you are not a man, but an apparition and it is an abomination that you are allowed to live among us. They have started rumors and telling stories that the gods are punishing us for your presence here. Of course, His Majesty doesn't believe any of this, but he is under a great deal of pressure to act in order to bring peace in the court, and among his people. He has come to a decision that he will leave your fate up to the gods. If you live or whether you die it will be entirely their will. He has instructed us to set you adrift in the ocean on a block of ice. If you live, you may return to your village and exist as if nothing ever happened. Of course if you die he expects that the troublemakers around him will stop their petitions to have you put to death. Either way, there is no good outcome for you. We were instructed to take you by any means necessary but I know if you decide to resist, we would be powerless to stop you. So I will ask that you surrender willingly. My fear is that if you don't do this, His Majesty will be forced to send troops into your newly founded village and those that serve you and care about you will be the ones to get hurt. I've never forgotten the words of the mantis. That one day I would be betrayed by those I served, and I would have to offer up my life willingly for those I cared about. I knew from the beginning that this too was part of my destiny. And I knew I could not escape it. I offered my hands in a gesture of surrender to the large man as he began tying restraints around my hands and torso. I could now hear the woman start to break down as the soldiers prepared to transport me. Looking back at her I bowed politely and told her not to worry about me, but to continue to raise and train my nephew in the custom of our people. She acknowledged me by respectfully bowing low and kneeling down to embrace the young boy who would now lead our village. The quiet giant now looping a rope over my hands and pulling it tightly around my wrist to lead me off. I could feel the pulling at my wrists and arms, and the sensation was so real it began to wake me from my dream. But as I awoke there was the shadow of a large man leaning over me and he seemed to be restraining my wrists. Was this part of the dream or was this part of reality? I could no longer tell the difference. The sudden sensation of being held down startled me and I reacted by rolling to the floor and grabbing the man's wrists to break his grip. The man dropping to the floor and pulling away from me as he grabbed his wrist as if he were in a great deal of pain. I could hear others in the room rushing to help me up and to check on the injured man. As the awareness of my surroundings started to return to me, I realized the large man was just part of the medical staff. Min Ho stepped in between us and while facing me she looked over her shoulder at the man behind her and asked, Are you okay? He nodded yes as another attendant began to assess his injuries. I think maybe my wrist is broken, he said. Realizing I injured the man I tried to apologize. My words stumbled unclearly from my lips. But the injured man seemed to understand me and accepted my apology. Min Ho motioned for the man to leave while recommending he have one of the doctors take a look at it. Then Mido turned her attention to me. How about you? Are you all alright? I nodded yes and then she went on to say to me, 
The intern was just removing your restraints, there was nothing for you to be afraid of. I lowered my head and apologized once again still having difficulty forming the words with my mouth.